Well, good morning, Emmanuel. What a beautiful day it is. I thought I'd come outside for the announcements. As you can imagine, here at the office, some of our staff are not super thrilled to have the snow this early. Um, but I don't know if you remember, I did a thought for the day way back where I came and stood here in the rain. And uh, so I thought I'd come out here to do the announcements for this week. Anyway, I got quite a few announcements. First of all, I want to welcome you. Thank you for joining our online service, Emmanuel at Home. And uh, we're just trusting that you're knowing God's blessing. Thank you so much for those who watch each week. And thank you for the notes of encouragement. Just thanking us for the work that goes into putting on these services, or making them available online. So let me get to my announcements. I think I got seven. So hopefully you'll be able to keep track. So first of all, we got Sundays with the Saints. That's coming up tonight. It's here at the church. And uh, 640, sorry, 545. And uh, that's that ice cream kind of missionary biography evening. The sign up for that is on the website. So go to the website, sign up, and we'll see you this evening. That's number one. Number two, uh, Bethlehem Star Volunteers, as Pastor Tyler was mentioning last week. We're not doing the typical Bethlehem Star, but we're still actually hoping to do some kind of event. Actually, just right over here. You can't see it. It won't be in the shot, but right over there, we're hoping to have sort of some kind of a static display. So what do we need? We need two things two groups of people to help us out. We need one group that's more of like a construction uh, group that will come in and build it's kind of some kind of platform. I'm not exactly sure, but build a platform, build a set. And then we need the second crew is more of a decorating kind of crew. So if either of those two are your areas of strength, would you please contact Pastor Don and let him know that you can help with that. The third announcement that I want to mention this morning uh, the Deaconess Coffee Morning is coming up. That's November the 7th, right here at the church. It's between 9 and 11.30, and it's kind of a drop-in event. Uh, you can just come and have a coffee with the Deaconesses, and they'll be happy just to minister to you. I don't know if I've said it already, but just to clarify, that's a Ladies' Coffee Morning. Um, so, Ladies' Coffee Morning, November the 7th, and it's hosted by the Deaconesses. Uh, so come alongside, you just drop in and have a visit with the deaconesses. So for the month of November, uh, men, you can come along and you can join in a Bible study. It's just every Saturday morning. There's four Saturday mornings in November. Um, and you're going to want to reach out to uh, Rob Eggert. He has all the information in that. It's going to be from 8 to 9.30. And now the question will be, where in the building will it be? I'm not sure, and I'll tell you why, because with, there's a couple of other events, the, lady, the Deaconess's Coffee Morning, we're trying to get everybody fitted in, but still adhere to our COVID protocols. Uh, so men, you're going to want to get a hold of Rob Eggert, get more information on that, and uh, plan to attend that Bible study series. That's number four. Number five, November business meeting. Uh, we're able, now that we've got the balcony up and running, we're going to do a real live uh, business meeting and that's coming up on November the 19th at 7 p.m. and so we would encourage members all are welcome to attend but especially members we would encourage you to come and uh, just uh, we've got some stuff that we need to be um, like voting through as a congregation and get set in place so if you can plan to be there please uh, that's November business meeting November 19th at 7 p.m. I think we are up to Six, yes, we are. Uh, you would have seen already the little intro for today's service was not the usual like slides, but it was photos. And you might be wondering, who are those people? Well, if you were to come here on a Sunday morning, we have Miller interns and they are helping us uh, just to be able to put on the services here. It's part of their field ed, part of their training at Miller. And so we want to also be praying for those people as well. Um, so there was eight of them and they are up at Miller, but they're coming here each Sunday and they serve some serve upstairs in the tech booth and uh, help them with uh, camera work and stuff like that. And some are helping down in the kids, the nursery program. So again, please pray for those eight students. Plus we know we've got our own students as well at other Bible colleges. We'll probably do a feature on those uh, post-grad or post-secondary education students uh, coming up. And then the last one, and this one, again, I seem to get the complicated announcements uh, that I have to, to try to explain to you. So it's an event that's called Bring Your Bubble to Our Bubble. Bring Your Bubble to Our Bubble. Now, you might know this if you don't have kids in school, but for the few days after Remembrance Day, well, I believe Remembrance Day and then the rest of that week, 
the kids are actually off school. Um, part, part of it is to do with COVID um, and just taking a bit of a break and helping the teachers to reset, I believe is part of the plan. Anyway, we wanted to use that time. So on the 12th and the 13th, we're gonna have the inflatable set up. You know the inflatables that we use for the summer ministries? We're gonna have them set up in the gym and we want you guys just to come and to bring your bubble to our bubble. So come and book a time slot. So it's a one hour time slot. The inflatables will be in there. Come with your family and you'll do the booking through Erin in the office and there'll be the inflatables. There'll also be, uh, there's uh, gonna be a little Bible video to watch. I believe there's some Bible teaching. I'm not sure if there's food. I, I don't think there's food, but there's a couple of different activities that you, your family could come. And if you know that, for example, there's two families in your bubble, then those two families could come together. I think it's up to a max of about 20 people is what we can have in at one time. And so if you know there's two or three families or maybe part of your small group would like to come along, it says it mentioned it's the 12th and the 13th of November. Um, and so book your time slot. And that'll be uh, during, the, during the day or maybe even into the evening. I'll get clarification for that. I'll go out in an email this week. So that's to bring your bubble to our bubble. And you know what, I've said it's for families with kids. But you know what, truth be told, if you want to come and use the inflatables for an hour and you're not a kid, you uh, call Aaron and I'm sure we'll be able to fit you in somewhere. So that's all the announcements. I hope you're able to follow them. Um, I hope they got them straight enough that you're able to understand what I'm trying to get across. Well, let's just pause. It's always good just to pause, take that breath as we, as we transition into worship here. So uh, can I pray? Let's pray. Father, I'm just thinking even of the verse, Lord, that though your sins are as scarlet, they shall, they shall be white as snow. And Father, we are just amazed again over the truth of forgiveness, over the truth that, Lord, you hold no uh, transgression against your people. You've forgiven us of our transgressions. And Lord, just even with this snow falling, I'm reminded of purity, and that purity is a gift from you. And Lord, it's only you who can do this, Lord. We just recognize that only you can forgive sins. And so, Lord, because of that, we worship you. Lord, we think of Philippians 2, where it says Christ has been given that name that is above every other name. And it's because of what he has done, because he humbled himself, humbled himself to obedience upon a cross. And so, Lord, we just want to, we want to transition to worship. And so still our hearts, even already, maybe we've got questions about the announcements or just other things that are filling our minds. Would you help us to pause? and to be able to engage in worship. And Lord, again, although we are watching this in our homes, we just recognize that together we come to worship you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would, we're just thankful for the body. We're thankful for the unity and what we share in together, that new life in Christ. Father, again, if there are those who are watching who don't know you as Savior, Lord, I pray that even in watching this sermon, that, Father, that you would open their eyes to see the glorious gospel, to see who Christ is, and that they would be saved. Lord, continue with us now, we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us again. You're the only God 
time began. You are on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, in the good times and Sings my soul.
I want to tell you a little bit more about Paul's life. When we first met Paul, he wanted to put people in prison for following the Lord Jesus. But Saul, or Paul as we now know him, his life was totally turned around on the way to Damascus when God spoke with him. From that point on, Paul wanted to tell everybody about the Lord Jesus, and so Paul would travel around telling people this good news. But it wasn't always easy. There was times, well, we already heard about when he was beaten and put into prison because he made some men so angry. There was other times, like last week, we re- where we heard about how he told people to turn from vain and worthless things. One time, when Paul was in Asia, there was a man there named Demetrius. Demetrius was a silversmith, and his job, what he did to make money, was to take silver and to make false gods. And what would happen is when people would come, they would buy these false shrines or gods from Demetrius, and that's how Demetrius made his money. But the problem is, Paul was telling people to turn away from those false gods. And so Demetrius, that meant there was a worry for him because he wouldn't be making as much money. And so he gathered the other people, the same business in that area, and he gathered them together to talk about about what, what Paul was saying. And Paul was telling them that the gods made with human hands were not gods. Well, That message is true, but that made those men super angry and it caused a riot in the city and the whole city was filled with confusion. There was another time when 40 Jews made a plan to kill Paul. They actually decided that they weren't going to eat or drink anything until Paul was killed. But Paul's nephew heard about the plan and was able to warn Paul and Paul escaped during the night. That wasn't the only time that Paul had to escape during the night. There was another time when a different group of Jews also made a plan to kill him. And at that time, he was able to escape through an opening of the wall in a basket. Do you know what? It wasn't easy for Paul to follow Jesus. You know what? We've heard about how he was beaten and put in prison for speaking the truth of God's word. But even though it was difficult, Paul continued to be faithful to love and obey and follow the Lord Jesus. That's quite a challenge for us because it's not always easy to follow the Lord Jesus. It's not always easy to do what God asks us to do. But there are so many promises in God's word, promises for those people that love and obey him. So my challenge for you this week is to look look through your Bible and to find some of those promises that God gives to people that love and follow and are faithful to obey what God has asked them to do. Well, good morning, Emmanuel. It is great again to be able to be with you. 
Um, even though every time I say that, I think it sounds like a funny thing to say, but um, certainly we are still united as a church family, and that is a, an awesome thing. Um, we actually just had a discussion. You might hear a little bit of background noise today. Uh, we're doing a bit of work still around the building, and uh, the discussion was, do we prefer the little bit of background noise that happens now because things are going on in the building, or the early days of COVID when it was nice and quiet, but it was quiet because no one was here, and I think we will 100% take the, the first that uh, we're just glad that we're able to be functioning as a church family as much as we are. Uh, and speaking of that, I did want to just share one answer to prayer. Um, I, I don't expect that many of you are following the mass gathering um, guidelines as closely as we are as a church uh, in our leadership because we have to be able to follow those things. But a change was made the end of September. You might be aware of it. We've talked about it a little bit. And the change was that there was going to be an hour requirement between gatherings, which makes our Sunday morning rhythm um, not so feasible anymore. So we've been praying. We've been in discussion with Interior Health, uh, who then reached out to Provincial Health on our behalf. And uh, we are just absolutely thrilled to be able to let you know that uh, it would seem like, although there's still just a couple more steps we have to take uh, before all is said and done, that we'll be able to uh, get a variance from Interior Health so that we're able to keep going the way we are. So thank you for those of you who are praying. It is just good to know that God cares for his church and he's done it again for us in this way. Uh, the other great news that you've already heard uh, this morning in the announcements is the uh, the conclusion of our women's ministry search and I'm just so thankful for the crew that served on that team and all those who applied um, and for the women of this church and we are just excited for how God is going to work through that ministry and uh, just excited for the 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 news that Melissa is going to be able to be there as a resource to that ministry and to our women and so we're going to pray for her in just a moment I uh, did want to mention just a happy birthday to Denise Butt and to David Farnes as they celebrate today. Um, and as we go to prayer, I um, just want you to uh, be lifting up Lance and Rachel Davison. They're expecting very soon their next uh, little one. And uh, Rachel's just had a bit of a tougher week. And so please be praying for them, for her, for this new little life. Uh, we'll do that in a moment. And then just one last praise item. Uh, last Sunday, we had another newcomer's dinner, and uh, it was different. It's our first one during COVID, and so we had it. It did look a little different, but uh, we're just amazed. I think I'd have to double check with Roxanne to confirm it, but I think it was our biggest newcomer's dinner we've ever had. So if you've been watching at home and haven't been part of Sunday mornings over the last months, uh, you might not be aware of just some of the amazing things that God is doing uh, in our church right now as we've just had a whole bunch of people that God has brought to Emmanuel, and we're just uh, excited to continue to be a church family. So pray for those who are new. Um, it's challenging for those who aren't able to come, and if you're sitting at home, there's a whole set of challenges. You can imagine how challenging it is to, to perhaps move to a community and not have any connections during this time and try to figure out how to do that, uh, and then even to become part of a church through a time like this is... Uh, definitely a challenge. So pray for those who are a new part of our church family and look forward to uh, when you get to meet them. So let's pray together and then we're going to open God's word. Father, thank you so much for the way that you have cared for this church. Uh, this last week, this news that we will be able to work out a variance with Interior Health is just another evidence of your care for this church. And we are thankful for those in Interior Health who have been willing to work with us and to navigate these things. Um, give them wisdom. Um, help them as they, they carry what I suspect to be a, a whole lot of responsibility uh, through this time. And so just give them wisdom. And Father, we think of that just even in light of the election that we are just coming through navigating right now. Father, would you lead and guide us as a province? Uh, and we do pray for our leaders as you have commanded us to do, that they would govern with wisdom, with integrity, um, and that in all that, that you would lead many in those leadership roles to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. Um, we do thank you for those who are new to our church, and again, we just recognize that these are 
harder days to become a part of a church family. There's just an unusual thing. In, in fact, really when we think of it, many who are new really won't even have a, a complete sense of what we're about as a church because things have been so different. But Father, we pray that there would be much joy, that there would be great relationships formed um, even in these days. And Father, we thank you for this last weekend and the good event we were able to have. We just pray for your continued protection over our church family as there's just ebbs and flows to ministry life and um, health situations. Father, we pray for your grace for this church. We thank you for the great news of Melissa Porter coming on board in the role of Director of Women's Ministries. Would you give her wisdom and grace to do well in that role and to just be a great support to the great ministries that are already going on. Father, this wasn't a decision made because of a, of a crisis. This was a decision made because we recognized an amazing opportunity that you have brought to us. And so we just pray that you would continue to do a great ministry among the women of our church and in this community as well. That you would just be gracious to reach out through us with the good news of Christ. We pray for Rachel Davison today in just a special way that you would be with her, with Lance, with their family, as she prepares for this um, delivery of this little baby. Would you strengthen her body um, and just care for them, that there would just be a healthy delivery, that Rachel would be healthy, this little one would be healthy, and that this family would just have much joy knowing that you have cared for them. And Father, I pray for all those who are still at home. We know there's just a variety of complex issues that are going on and father would you just bless each one who would be opening up your word now with me as they would watch that you would just encourage them and father even as we think of this passage that speaks to this issue of not losing heart would you give us a confidence in our hearts and minds that we would be a people of immense hope because we've come to know who you are we thank you we love you we pray this in christ's name amen I hope you've got a Bible and that you would turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're picking up in verse 7, kind of where we left off. So last week we just sort of started into verse 7. We're going to pick up in verse 7 and then work our way to the end of the chapter. Um, and as you uh, open up there, um, let me just kind of take you back, maybe to a show you've seen. I don't even know if it's on TV. I don't really watch a ton of TV anymore, but I do remember a day every once in a while stumbling across this show called... Um, what do they call it? The, the antique show or, uh, no, it wasn't the road show or something like that, where people brought in uh, old things, uh, like antiques they owned, to get them valued. And so I remember uh, not watching often, but the odd time you'd see someone, you know, bring in, it's like, here's a coffee table. It was in my aunt's attic. And then, you know, we were moving out a bunch of junk and I brought it home and I'm kind of curious. And then you find out it's some you know, piece of furniture from France and it's worth a fortune or, or typically the ones I loved were the ones where someone went to a garage sale and it's like, hey, we bought this, you know, this old painting and we, you know, spent a buck fifty and we're just curious and it turns out it's like some masterpiece worth, you know, half a million and people's lives are changed and it's just, it's sort of an interesting kind of show, an interesting sort of premise that really is all about people not recognizing the value of something. Um, and finding treasures kind of in unusual spots. Every time I've watched that, I've thought, you know, I wouldn't be the one to find the treasure. I'd probably be the, the, the kind of guy who sold the valuable thing at the garage sale. And it's like, whoo, I got my dollar. Meanwhile, someone else, you know, made the half million. But, but as I think about what Paul's talking about here in 2 Corinthians 4, that kind of image actually comes to mind because it's almost like Paul's painting a picture for us of, of this odd scene of a of a clay pot a very ordinary clay pot that is the the holding place the the storage place of a great treasure which is sort of a bit of a strange scene now we've talked last week a little bit about clay pots but they were just sort of a very ordinary very common thing in fact if you go to the middle east particularly israel today and you walk around at all these sites probably if you're like a typical tourist one of the first things you'll do is you look down around you and you see these pieces of pottery and you start collecting them in your pockets like you can't believe there's so much around and you found this great treasure and you fill your pockets when no one's looking 
And uh, then you find out afterwards that actually this stuff is everywhere. It's just like garbage. And probably people were looking at you kind of puzzled. It's like, why is that guy picking up all the clay garbage off the ground? Because it's just so plentiful. It's just, it's like literally almost like rocks on the ground in some places. And, and the reason I think Paul brings up this image is because he expects us to be able to kind of relate to it. So I'll give you my best attempt to relate to it. It would be the equivalent of like a, a packaging from a fast food meal. Like if you ever walk down a street and you look in the ditch and there's a McDonald's cup and a sort of wadded up bag, there might be sort of an equivalency there of something that's really not, you know, the package was just a package. It's not really a valuable package. You discard it and kind of throw it away like trash. Clay pots kind of like that. It's not a valuable thing. They were just a very common, very ordinary thing in the ancient world. And so Paul comes along and he starts talking about a treasure we have, the treasure being the good news of the glory of Jesus Christ and what he's done and what God's done. And then said, we, we have that treasure in jars of clay. And where are the jars of clay? Just sort of ordinary. And so I can kind of imagine back in Paul's day, the accusation against Paul is, hey, Paul, you're weak. You're not very impressive. You're not a great communicator. You're very ordinary looking. Um, you, you don't sound philosophical like the great teachers of the day. You're not sort of culturally relevant. I don't know what language they would have used. And I imagine Paul saying, I know, isn't it great? I am just a clay pot, but the news I get to convey is a treasure. And as I think of the rest of the New Testament, particularly in the Gospels, particularly around the story of the birth of Christ, probably you've noticed the same thing I have, that, that there's something stunning about the ordinary nature of the story. Jesus is born in Bethlehem, not Rome, not Athens, not Alexandria, not one of these great cities of antiquity. And then he comes to common, ordinary fishermen, not, you know, not, you know, Plato or Aristotle. He could have chosen, you know, Virgil or one of these great figures of the ancient world. But, but he sets all that aside and says, no, I'm on the hunt for, for clay pots so that I could call them to myself so that the treasure of the glory of God in the gospel will shine through. And that's kind of how Paul really begins this next little section that we want to consider together this morning. Now, I do want to point out one thing that we have to go back to verse 1 to see. That there in chapter 4, verse 1, he talks about not losing heart. We've unpacked that over a couple weeks. But, you know, just this realization that in the world, things happen. We can, we can be we can become despondent, we can give up, we can, as a result of our despondency or discouragement, start to do things that we know we ought not to or that we never would have done otherwise. And if you look ahead to chapter 4, verse 16, you can see Paul picks up the same idea. So we do not lose heart. And in a way, you could kind of almost picture all of chapter 4 as Paul's response to, why don't you give up, Paul? Like, like, if you're against such huge odds, if life is so difficult, if things are so hard, why don't you just, why don't you just lose heart? Why haven't you given up? And chapter 4 is almost like Paul's answer to that, which I'm excited for because I think sort of the flip side to sort of the coin of, of not losing heart is just the realization that there are lots of reasons to lose heart. I don't want to deliver bad news this morning, but I think in Paul's mind, it's almost like he's saying it would be a very natural thing to lose heart and therefore we have to have a very supernatural reason to not lose heart. There has to be something about God that is going to cause us to, to not give up. And so we're going to unpack that this morning a little bit more of why don't we lose heart? And I just want to direct you to verse 16 because I think it's actually kind of the hinge verse in this chapter, particularly in the section from verse 7 to 18. So I'll read it to you, just that one verse, and explain how I think this verse is going to work. So, or therefore, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For, and then he carries on. So I, I just want you to go from so, or therefore, some translations, to for, right? And both those words in either end are words that are really saying there's an explanation. So the first one, therefore, or so, implies that what Paul's just said is a reason for what he's about to say. 
So he says something from verse 7 to verse 15 and then says, therefore, or because of that, or in light of that, we don't lose heart. So what I want to suggest to you is from verse 7 to 15, we're going to come up with a reason, or I'm actually going to try to point out two reasons why we will not lose heart even when things are difficult. And then if you think it through, in verse 17, he says, for. So in other words, he says, so we don't lose heart for. And the word for is going to point us to another reason. Uh, and that's another one of those words that just kind of gives us an indication of a purpose or a connection here. So in other words, we've got this statement in the middle. We don't lose heart because of what came before and because of what comes after. And our job today is to see if we can unpack those three reasons. All right. So let me read the first section and we'll see if we can draw out the two things that Paul seems to point to. Verse 7, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not given to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying the body, the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our body. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God, so we do not lose heart. Now, there's a lot there. There's probably fuel for a number of sermons, but I wanted to make sure we get right to what I think the point Paul's driving at. He pictures this clay pot, this, this jar that's ordinary, that's not particularly powerful, and then he pictures this fact that this, this little pot contains or displays this great treasure that is the glory of God, and there's a reason behind it. It's not just sort of a coincidental thing. He says, so that. In other words, God has designed it this way. This was part of God's purpose. He orchestrated it. And I think you need to see that because it's just this reminder to us that, that weakness is not, it's not an incidental thing. It's, it's an essential thing. And we live even today, but certainly in Paul's day as well, where people love power and influence and all those kind of things, but, but that's not the design of God. God's design is to use, well, as Paul says earlier to the Corinthians, we can foolish things to confound the wise and the powerful. He's using ordinary things so that when God works, people understand it's God, not getting confused about the strength of an individual. And Paul says, God has a surpassing power to accomplish this, surpassing power. That's a great statement. We might come back to that one a little bit um, as we just think a little bit more on kind of how Paul kind of is going to track this argument through. And it's, it is not a new thought to Paul. I just want to point that out because I'll probably forget it a little bit later. But Paul is the same one who talks about God's power being perfect in weakness. In other words, what he's saying is that that me as a weak person is a perfect vessel. It's a perfect display for God's power so that we see and understand that it's God who is at work. It's why he, in other places, seems to just take an immense joy in, in describing how, how difficult life is, how weak he is, how how limited he is, and he does it because he knows that that's going to help people to understand the greatness of God. Now, we read that verse, and then he moves into this series of little statements of, we are afflicted in every way and not crushed. We are um, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. So Paul kind of, what he's doing in those four statements is he is intensifying the difficulty. We're not going to break down each one, but essentially each each one of those things. So he starts with, we are afflicted. And then he says, we are perplexed. And then we are um, persecuted. And then we are uh, struck down. 
what happens as he does that is each one of those is getting harder and harder and harder. But then on the flip side is the response that we are afflicted but not crushed. The not crushed is always a little bit stronger than the afflicted. So it's kind of like, um, some people put it like this way, that we are, this, this pressured one, for example, that we are um, or, or perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted, not abandoned. He's like, it's like we're being squeezed squeezed so tight but but not squashed like that's and actually a lot of what goes on here is actually uh there's a lot of rhyme to the language there's kind of certain a rhythm that's going on here all to help us understand that paul's saying hey look i understand that the life of a clay pot can be a hard difficult life there are there are challenges and paul certainly is well qualified to talk about this but his observation is that the surpassing power of god always sustains the clay pot. That's his point. He's really saying, look, we have a God who has surpassing power and his power is so great that even if you feel struck down, and the word is like to actually hit someone with a weapon, so they're like struck down, but you get back up. That's, that's what Paul's describing. We're, we're at a loss, but we're not lost, is what Paul's saying as he goes through these things. And Paul, I think, wants us to first see, why don't I lose heart, Paul? Why don't I just give up? Paul, why haven't you give up, given up? And Paul's answer would be, look, I know the surpassing power of God is there for his people, his clay pot people. Therefore, he will always bring us through these things. It might not be in the timing we want, even in the way we want, but God's power is sufficient to sustain us. If you go look in uh, chapter 1, verse 9, you get, remember, we've looked at this, it was a few weeks back, where Paul says this. He says, Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. In other words, the things he was going through were so hard. He said, It was like I had received the death sentence. And that was almost like he's picturing it being carried out. But, he says, that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Paul's saying, There was a purpose behind it. It was to to teach me I needed to rely on the surpassing power of God. And what I want to point out to you is how powerful it is in that case because Paul says he's able to raise the dead. Like how much power does that take? I don't even, we don't even have a category for that. But Paul says that's how much power God has. He has enough power to raise the dead. And so Paul says we can not lose heart because we know firstly a God who is powerful enough to raise the dead. Secondly, as he moves on in verse 10 to 15, and I'm going to take the second reason out of that passage, Paul says, we are always carrying around in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our body. For we who, uh, who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Paul is now comparing or kind of playing with the word life and death. Just like he had these word pairs back in verse 8 and 9, now he's dealing with the word pair of life and death. And I think what he's trying to show, and you can go and read through the logic, he's he's really saying something like this. He said, even if me as a clay pot is dying, God is using that to produce life. And you see, he's going to weave that thought through he really brings it to a head in verse 12 actually in a very surprising way because I think verse 12 would have very naturally read something like this that death is at work in us but life is also at work in us but but he doesn't he says death is at work in us but life in you in other words what Paul's doing is he's connecting the dots for us and the dots connect somehow like this that God works in my trials in the difficulties in the things that ought to cause me to lose heart, those things, firstly to display his power, the one we just looked at, and now secondly, to use those very things to produce life in other people. And I wish I could bring up just person after person to tell their story, because I've heard so many of these, whose stories about coming to faith in Jesus Christ, about God working in their life, started with them saying, my story all began when I saw someone who was a Christian go through immense difficulty and trial, and the way I saw them go through it caused me to stop and consider, what is it that these people have that I don't have? And I, I, I'm almost certain you, if you stopped and thought through, you would know people in the exact same scenario. 
And that's what Paul's talking about. Now in verse 13, this is probably maybe one of the trickiest ones of this whole passage because he's quoting Psalm uh, 116. So let me just kind of give a quick sense of I think what he's trying to get at. He's trying to say something like this. Back in Psalm 116, David is going through an immense trial. He actually speaks of death in there. So something's going on in his life that brings him to the verge of thinking he's going to die, probably an illness by the sounds of what David describes. But he says, I believe... God's going to bring me through this. I believe God will deliver me from death. And so in faith, I speak and proclaim that. Now, you think what Paul's doing here. He's doing exactly the same. He says, since we have the same spirit of faith. The same spirit of faith is who? As David in Psalm 116. Who said, I believe and so I spoke. And Paul quotes him there. And then he says, We also believe and so we also speak. So Paul's saying the thing that David did in Psalm 116 is the same thing that we're doing right here. We have a faith and a trust in God that leads us to proclaim something. Now, I think verse 14 is the thing that Paul is saying he believes that allows him to proclaim something. Here it is that Paul believes, knowing that he who raised Jesus or sorry, raised the Lord Jesus, will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. In other words, Paul's saying, I have a rock solid confidence that God raised Jesus from the dead. Therefore, God is going to raise me from the dead and that he is going to raise you from the dead. And you get that in that last sentence, us into his presence together. And so Paul has this next purpose in mind. Why Paul Do you not lose heart when you're going through hard things? I think Paul would say, because I've come to understand that God has a purpose in it. And his purpose is for the sake of others. You see it even more clearly in the next verse. Verse 15, it's all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. If you think back to uh, Romans chapter 1, that's the fundamental issue for Paul, really, isn't it? If you go back and read it, people aren't giving thanks to God. They don't recognize who he is. They don't recognize what he's done. And Paul has a longing in his heart that people would understand who God is, understand the gospel, understand who Jesus is, and that as they come to understand that, they would give thanks to God because that would be an indication of their belief and trust in God and their love for God. And Paul says, all this, all what, Paul? Afflicted, crushed, perplexed, all that, it's for a reason. The reason is because God is going to use that for the sake of others to bring them into the kingdom. So we've got two great reasons. Why do you not lose heart? First, I believe in the power, surpassing power of God who can sustain me. And if you're sitting and watching today and you're going through hard things, I just want you to know you have a God who can sustain you. There is no difficulty. There's no affliction. There's no, there's no thing that perplexes us. There's no thing that that persecutes us or strikes us down that God is not able to sustain us through. And I know that's a huge statement. There's even part of my heart that starts arguing against it, but God's word says it's true. Paul says, look at my life. And I think if we stop and really consider it, really wrestle that one through, we're going to realize that that is true. That is a rock solid ground for us not losing heart. Then secondly, is this, this realization that Paul is saying, God is going to use. Nothing's going to go to waste. Your difficulties won't go to waste. God's going to use that to draw people to himself that would increase thanksgiving and ultimately give glory to God. And so your your challenges, God has in mind a purpose. It's actually very similar to what he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says in verse 10, For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are elect. In other words, Paul is saying, I'm going through hard things, all these things. I'm enduring them. For the sake of, because I know God is accomplishing something over here for some other people. All right, so there's the first two big purposes I want to make sure we understand. Then we get to my favorite one. And I don't know if you should pick favorites in a case like this, because they're all good. But we come to these last couple verses on the other side of verse 16. So we do not lose heart for, in verse 17. In other words, Paul is now introducing another reason for us. Some of the Some of my favorite verses now in all of Scripture coming up. He says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Now, isn't that an awesome statement? Paul is 
I think what he's saying, you, could, you, you read this through carefully, I think what he's saying is, look, you can't compare these things. But then he sort of does. <laughs> he, he says there, you can't compare the difficulty, the affliction you're going through to the glory that's to come. But then he starts bringing up sort of ways of measuring things. He first says our affliction is like something that is light and momentary. That's the we- measurement of weight and time. In a time sense, it ultimately compares to the eternity to come and it looks like it's just such a brief thing compared to the length and duration of eternity. And then he says not only that, but it's a light thing. It's like if you could weigh your trials, which obviously you can't. Paul knows that. But he's saying if you could put them on a scale and then put eternity and glory that's to come on a scale, one measures light. And then he says the other, you've got to love this language here in verse 17, an eternal weight of glory. The word glory translates an Old Testament word that actually means weighty. Um, and so I think if we get this right, he's saying there's an eternal weight of weightiness. <laughs> he's like, our difficulties now compared to eternity are light and short. And eternity is heavy and substantive and it's real and it's eternal and it goes on and I love it and he says it's like beyond all comparison now I I'm actually pretty good at comparing things probably most of you are too like I think it's part of what it means to be human we're pretty good at relating one thing to another like if uh, if someone say has never been to Disney and then you're going well I want to try to explain what Disneyland's like you probably you'd find ways to compare things with it. It's like, maybe you'd say, have you ever been to, uh, you know, um, Silverwoods, the one down in Idaho? Well, Disney's kind of like that, but the rides are newer and higher and faster and uh, it's, it's bigger. And so you might kind of compare. And if someone, well, I've never been to Silverwoods, it's like, well, have you been to the IPE? And we recognize that there's a pretty significant gulf between those two things, but you can still compare. You can get from the IPE to Disney. It's like the rides, again, like a whole different scale, but there's food and there are rides and there's concessions and there's all these things. You could compare, but Paul's saying, you want to know what you can't compare? There is nothing in this world that you can even take and compare to the glory that's to come. Just think of that for a moment. The Alps, the stars, the ocean, a beautiful mountain meadow, a waterfall, a raging river. Paul's like, yep, yeah, none of it. None of it gets you from the glory of what's to come to something that you can see here. It just, it doesn't compare. That's shocking to me because like I said, I can compare the IPE to Disneyland. But Paul says you can't, there's nothing here that even is comparable to what's to come. And I hope as you think that through, you would start to see Paul's argument come into focus because here's what he's saying to us. The glory that's to come can't be compared to anything now. And what we are going through now is actually preparing us. You you see the language. I'm not making this up. He says it right there in verse 17. Affliction is preparing. It's not just proceeding. It's not just like it happens to come before glory. It's like, no, no. The affliction actually has a role. And I don't understand fully how God works that out or how all the pieces fit together. I just see it plainly in his word. What we're going through, the hard things you are going through today, the physical things, the relationship things, the difficulties, they are preparing glory that is to come that is not comparable to anything here. It's so far better. And then verse 18. And I want you to see this one. We're going to end here. This is the important one because this is how. This is Paul. How does that work out? Because if you're saying, Paul, there's three reasons not to lose heart. God has enough power to sustain us. God has a purpose that he's going to use my suffering to to see others come to Christ. And then this last one that, that I'm not going to lose heart because what's going on now, the difficulty, the affliction, Paul uses that word, is is preparing for me a future glory that's so far better than anything now. I can't even compare something now to it. Paul, how does that last one happen? And he answers it in verse 18. As we look not to things that are seen, 
but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, the things that are unseen are eternal. Paul says, all right, look, there are seen things and unseen things. Seen things are this stand, this stage, this building, your TV, that your laptop that you're watching on. Those are seen things. And Paul says, they're transient. They all wear out. They're temporary things. And we know that, right? Your laptop is going to be obsolete in a few years, and it'll be done, and you'll have to replace it. This stand will eventually wear out. This building will eventually wear out. They're transient things. But then Paul says there's another category of things that are unseen things, and they are the, the real things. They are eternal things. They aren't going to wear out. Paul says what's at stake here is those things. And so we need to fix our eyes on those things. Jesus, heaven, God, salvation, the people of God redeemed in his presence. Those are unseen things and they are eternal things. And Paul says, the way we allow affliction to prepare glory is by fixing our eyes on those things, making sure that we see those things. It's actually, it's a great word really, and I I won't bore you too much with it, but it's the word to examine or to consider. And the idea is that we actually, we critically look at something to, ter- ter- to determine its worth or value. And so Paul says, I want you to hold up temporary things versus eternal things, seen things versus unseen things. And I want you to ask yourself this question, what actually has value? And once you have answered that question for yourself, fix your eyes on it. Don't take your eyes off of that thing. Paul uses the same word. He uses it over in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, when he says, each of you should look not to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. The word look to your own, that's the same word. Look, consider, fix your eyes on, never take them off. I don't know. Um, maybe I, should, maybe I shouldn't use myself as an example. It's sometimes a little bit embarrassing. But I don't have a very hard time looking to my own things being concerned about my own things. I look at my lawn and compare it to my neighbors and get concerned about my lawn. Uh, Snowed today, right? I'm one of these guys who drives by every little street and notices whose street gets plowed and who doesn't. It's like, why did their street get plowed and my street doesn't? Now, it's not my street, but you know what I'm doing. It's like I'm looking, I am observing, I am watching, I'm focused on my interest. Very, very easy for me. That's why I need God's Word to say, don't do that. Don't look only to that. Look to others. But, but that's the sense of eyes fixed on, paying attention, observing these things. And Paul says, are your eyes fixed on eternity? As I was preparing this sermon, just reading through a few things, I came across a quote that kind of stopped me in my tracks a little bit. Or not a quote so much as a question. And, and it, the question was this, are we more likely to fix our eyes on our retirement that might last 20 or 30 years or our, our eternity? And the, the, the author who wrote it said, it's not that it's, a bad thing to save and prepare and for, to think about retirement. But if we're, if we're living for that, how misplaced is that when it's so transient where Paul is saying we need to live for eternity? I want to end up with just one last passage of Scripture. One thing to encourage you to meditate on over in Hebrews chapter 11 because there the author of Hebrews holds up Moses as an example of this very thing. And as I read it, just... Think of the passage we've just been working through in light of the example that we're given here in Moses. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the the son of Pharaoh's daughter. In other words, huge advantage, wouldn't you say, to being able to say, I am Pharaoh's daughter's son. Moses refused, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than enjoying the fleeting pleasure of sin. There it is. He looked and he's like, I could enjoy that, but it's transient. It doesn't last. So I'm going to choose something different. I'm going to choose to throw my lot in with God's people, even though right now it means affliction. I believe that what's to come is eternal. It's weightier. goes on and says, he considered the reproach of Christ a greater wealth than the treasure of Egypt. He looked and he said, which do I consider? Remember Paul's language is like, consider, which is better, transient, seen, eternal, unseen. And and Moses looked. He's like, this treasure or that treasure? I'll take this treasure. I know I can't see it, but this treasure is more real. It's more eternal. And I'm going to pursue that. For he was looking to the reward. In other words, 
Moses said, eyes fixed on something. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Eyes fixed. You get it? Eyes fixed. Seeing him who is invisible. In other words, he looked and he said, there is something unseen. That unseen thing is real. And I would leave you with that thought. Are your eyes fixed on the things that are real, eternal, weighty, that will outlast everything else? Are your eyes fixed on those things? Because if they are, what Paul is saying, those difficulties that we're going through now are going to prepare for us glory. And Paul says, therefore, we don't lose heart. We know what God is doing, his purpose for us, his power for us, and his preparation of a glory for us if we keep our eyes fixed on him. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for your word, for this passage, for your purposes and your promises in all this, that you would put your surpassing power at work for us so that when we go through trials and affliction, you will bring us through. And Father, we know that doesn't mean we don't come through without scars and wounds But Father, you have promised that you would sustain us. And so we don't lose heart. And Father, not only do we know that, but we also know that through those hard things, you are working out your purposes for the sake of others. There are others around us. They might be our family. They might be friends, co-workers. They might be people that we will not ever even realize we're watching. But they have seen something different. And through that, they have come to the place of giving thanks to God and ultimately producing glory for God. And so, Father, we pray that you would, through our affliction, produce life in others. And lastly, Father, we thank you that through these trials, when we keep our eyes fixed on you, what is eternal, what lasts, you have promised, we don't understand it all, but you have promised that you're going to use that very stuff for the accomplishment of an eternal thing for us. We praise you, we thank you. Help us to keep our eyes today and this week fixed on you. In Christ's name, amen.